Hello, everyone, and welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director, and today is February the 11th, 2023. I'm joined by our book club production team of Gail Hughes, our club coordinator, and Drea Klein-Bergman, our programs and campaigns manager. Today, we are transitioning from books about our history to a contemporary book entitled Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century by Augusto Lopez Claros, Arthur Lyon Dahl, and Maya Graf, who I'll be introducing in a moment. And today we'll be focusing on chapters one, two, and three. We'll proceed as usual with the authors pointing out what they feel are the main highlights and ideas in those chapters. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. We'll ask everyone to go on mute now if you're not already on mute and please remain on mute when you're not speaking so we can minimize any echoes and background noise. And you're welcome to use the chat to communicate with the group, but we won't be monitoring it. So if you have a question you wanna to direct to the authors, you'll need to ask that during the question and answer period. We'll stop about five minutes before the end of the session for any announcements that people have about relevant things they wanna promote. Um, so please hold those kinds of comments till the end. Um, also, if people join us in the middle and we don't recognize either their names or their numbers, we may stop and ask them to identify themselves to prevent any kind of hacking or Zoom bombing or any other nasty stuff that happens in cyberspace. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our authors um, we are joined by all three authors of the book, uh, which is a record for us. We've had one and two authors, but this time we're reading a book with three authors. So first, Augusto Lopez Claros, who's the executive director of the Global Governance Forum. During 2017 to 2019, he was senior fellow in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He is a former director of the Global Indicators Group at the World Bank and chief economist of the World Economic Forum, and he's co-author of Equality for Women Equals Prosperity for All. Arthur Lyon Dahl is president of the International Environment Forum and a retired senior official of UN Environment. He's the author of In Pursuit of Hope, A Guide for the Seeker, The Eco Principle, Ecology and Economics in Symbiosis, and Unless and Until, a Baha'i focus on the environment. And Maya Graf is an international lawyer based at The Hague, working on multinational, I'm sorry, multilateral treaties at international criminal tribunals and teaching at The Hague Academy of International Law. She's a graduate of Harvard, Oxford, and McGill universities, and has drafted international legal policy documents and published on private and public international law human rights, and global governance. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our authors. I will just say one thing to the authors that we often take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes for the authors to present their ideas, or I should say 15 minutes to a half hour. But given that there are three of you, my guess is we will probably go closer to the half hour to give you each a chance to, to speak. So uh, again, I turn it over to our authors and um, take it away. Um, thank you very much, um, Bob, and thank you, everybody, for, for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of Arthur and Maya as well to tell you that we are very happy to be with you today. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by telling you a little bit of, uh, about the sort of the, the background to this project. Um, and obviously, um, this is in, in reference to me personally. Um, Arthur and Maya probably have, you know, other sources of inspiration or other reasons why, you know, they came together, uh, you know, on this on this particular uh, text. For me, uh, one book that was a, a very important uh, part of my of my sort of upbringing uh, on global governance issues was World Peace Through World Law by Grenville Clark and uh, and uh, Louis Song. Uh, Grenville Clark, who was the leading leading author in that in that partnership, um, was a 
graduate from the Harvard Law School, and he had been a classmate of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and was a very influential public figure in 20th century America. Um, in the late 50s, he uh, teamed up with, uh, with another colleague of his at, at the law school in Harvard, and they basically came up with uh, this uh, uh, volume, World Peace Through World Law, which was an attempt to rethink the UN Charter. Uh, Clark especially felt very strongly that um, um, World War II had presented us with a unique opportunity to rethink our uh, global order and the institutions that underpin it. And he was very disappointed when he saw what came out of uh, San Francisco in 1945. Uh, he thought that it was a bit of a wasted opportunity. You know, 60 million people had died in World War II. And he thought that uh, the conference in San Francisco and the period leading up to the conference uh, uh, you know, was a great opportunity to have done something more ambitious in terms of institutional development. Um, and so um, in, in the introduction to World Peace Through World Law, um, uh, Clark, which, which Clark wrote, uh, he, he said that all of us understand the importance and the need for institutions at the national level you know, we understand that there has to be a parliament to make laws, there has to be a, a court system to interpret the laws, an executive to implement them. We accept the, the, the need for a central bank to regulate the money and to regulate the financial system. We think that we should have a police force to, to maintain order within the boundaries of the state. And we understand that to the extent that those institutions work, you know, we can lay a basis for prosperity and, and for economic growth and, and, and uh, um, you know, other, other progress. Um, when those institutions don't work, um, then we discover uh, many of the things that we see in the developing countries in particular, uh, instability, inflation, uh, uh, you know, disorder and chaos and, and so on, right? So the point that Clark was trying to make was that he said, in this day and age, uh, in the context of interdependence, in the context of countries that are um, more and more closely connected because of technology and, and, and uh, you know, other developments, trade, industry, education, and so on, we need to do at the global level what we have already done at the national level. We need to have institutions that can basically um, provide a framework for cooperation um, among countries in a way that delivers results, delivers peace and security, and delivers prosperity. Um, Clark lamented what came out of San Francisco with the UN Charter. He was a very strong critic of it, and he was not by any means the only one. Bertrand Russell, uh, Albert Einstein, and many other luminaries, uh, you know, at that time in the in the early 1940s, leading to the UN Charter, and then later on, after the UN Charter was adopted, you know, thought that there were um, uh, that this document was an important step in the in the right direction, but it had many many flaws. And Clark, in particular, you know, noted, for instance, the the rather odd distribution of voting power in the General Assembly with you know, one country, one vote. Uh, he was a very sharp critic of the, of the veto in the Security Council, which he thought would not provide a basis for sound progress on the peace and security side. Um, like Russell, he thought that the, the United Nations should have a peace force, uh, a military force that would be able to add meaning to the resolutions of the Security Council without the instrumentality of a, of, a, of, an, uh, of a peace force that would actually enforce international law. He thought that the United Nations would be hampered. And all these things you know, were very, very um, prescient. And, and you know, the experience of the, of the decades following the adoption of the UN Charter basically uh, proved this very, 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 very well. Um, so in the in the early chapters, especially chapter two, although one as well, you will see you know many references to the work of Clark and and uh, you know to the thinking that went around the time of the of the creation of the United Nations. 
Um, so, um, you know, people think that the United Nations came into being in San Francisco. That's not right. The United Nations actually was created in early 1942. What, what happened in the years after uh, 1942 was that there was some thinking as to what shape this organization was going to take and, you know, what were the principles on which it was going to be founded. And, and, and in that, that, that process of eventually conversion to the UN Charter is something that we describe in quite a bit of detail in chapter two of, of, of the book. And it, it's a really, a, I think it's an interesting story because the, the early 1940s were a period of great, um, uh, I would say, sensitivity to ideas of global governance because of what was happening in Europe, because uh, there was a great deal of chaos and destruction and killing and maiming and violence. Um, people were far more adventurous in terms of, you know, uh, how far they were willing to consider we should go uh, in terms of establishing uh, new mechanisms of international cooperation and essentially creating a new, a new global order. Um, one uh, interesting aside, which we go into some detail in chapter two, which I just like to I like to mention, um, is is basically the debate that took place around the introduction of the veto power in the Security Council. Um, you know that um, uh, when uh, when uh, uh, the delegates from 51 countries got together in San Francisco in April of uh, 1945 there was a sense of disappointment, uh, or actually uh, perhaps a, a stronger word is pertinent, outrage uh, in, among many of the members when they were essentially presented with what essentially was a bit of blackmail. The Soviet Union and the Americans told the assembled delegates, either you accept this UN Charter with the veto built in, or, or that there is no United Nations. And so uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Robert Fraser, um, uh, basically spearheaded an effort with 17 other countries, including Mexico and, and several others, Colombia and so on, uh, to essentially uh, introduce in the UN Charter an article which at least allow for the, for the possibility of a reconsideration of the UN Charter in the future and possibly the elimination of the veto. And so this is the famous Article 109, which uh, essentially says that uh, there will be a review conference or there can be a review conference within 10 years of the adoption of the charter um, where you know, we will consider um, uh, the appropriateness of the charter in light of developments and circumstances. And with this article, um, the, the charter was adopted, 15 of those 17 countries uh, you know, were placated enough to, to essentially endorse the charter. And as you well know, that conference has never actually taken place. Uh, by 1955, we're in the middle of the, of the Cold War, um, and uh, many of the aspirations which were embedded in the, in, the, in the charter in those early years basically had to adjust to this uh, sort of new political re reality of uh, the arms race, uh, the, polariz the ideological polarization between you know, the US and its allies in the West and the Soviet Union and its allies uh, in the East and in parts of the developing world and so on. So um, um, Cord Mayer, who was a young member of the delegation, the American delegation that went to, to um, San Francisco, he wrote a, a very insightful, very interesting article in the Atlantic um, you know, this uh, monthly magazine that still exists today. Uh, we actually have a copy of that article. We were able to find it in the Georgetown Library. And in that article, uh, which I think was published in 1946, early 1946, uh, a few months after the, the adoption of the charter, uh, Court Mayer is heavily critical of the UN, the, of, the, of the veto. He says that it is an anti anti-democratic measure that it will doom the United Nations effectiveness in, in providing a framework for peace and security. And, and he goes on and he says, you know, what do we think of an article of a feature of the of the of the UN Charter, which essentially exempts the the, the five permanent members from every principle 
that they have adopted in the chapter, right? Um, and of course, as you know, our history is full of, of uh, uh, the misapplication of, of that idea. And the most recent example, of course, is what we see with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia has violated every important principle of the UN Charter, and yet it is a member of good standing of the United Nations. Its foreign minister can go, he can enter the UN building, he can sit uh, around the table of the Security Council, he can bark and, and uh, sp spill out propaganda and insults to the international community, he can insult the intelligence of the 192 other members by making all kinds of nonsensical statements about you know, the reality of the world and, and, and still remain a, a, a member of, the, of that body. Um, let me finish my allotted 10 minutes by just a couple of other things. Chapter three goes into a fairly detailed discussion of the um, European Union. We see the European Union very much as a as a worthy model uh, uh, for international cooperation. Um, it started out um, as a, as a you know, six member countries in Europe creating this, uh, the, the, the steel and coal community. Um, for the first 10 years of the European Union, all they did was uh, reduce uh, trade barriers gradually uh, uh, for interstate trade among themselves. And yet here we are in 2023, the European Union has built an impressive infrastructure of institutions. There is a European Parliament which has evolved. Uh, it went from a debating society in 1958 to directly elected members in the 1970s. And now it is a body that brings together more than 700 representatives from 20, 27 nations that does a European law that is binding on all its members. There is a European Central Bank. There is a commission, which is the executive arm of the European Union. There is a European Court of Justice. We think that for people who are except, skeptical about the possibilities of meaningful international cooperation based on you know, strong supranational institutions, which provide a basis for very, very creative and, and, and lasting international cooperation, the European Union is a very useful model. Uh, it's uh, it's one way in which at least I have found it very often useful to to counter the 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 somewhat cynical or fearful statements of the of the skeptics. Um, there is a great deal more that can be said, but uh, my time is up, so I will I will stop here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Augusta. And um, who will be speaking next? I guess maybe I should come next and for following the order on the. On the, on the book, because I came from a very different perspective. As a, I'm an environmental scientist, a specialist on complex e environmental systems like coral reefs. And of course, I have seen the collapse of coral reefs around the world in, since I was a research scientist at Smithsonian Institution in the early 1970s. So, you know, I've been driven by the, the rapid rise of environmental crises of various sorts that can only be managed you know, at the global level. Uh, I was at the Stockholm conference in 1972, representing the bi-international community. So I've been involved in issues of global environmental governance basically since the beginning. Uh, and then I moved to the Pacific Islands where I became the regional ecological advisor of all the Pacific Island countries. And I built a regional environmental program of all the countries, an intergovernmental organization, but a regional environment program. I then joined UNEP uh, and was deputy of the Oceans and Coastal Areas program building regional seas programs around the world, getting governments to cooperate in managing the different sea areas. I was in the Secretariat for the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 and responsible for the final drafting of Chapter 17 of Agenda 21 on ocean coastal areas and small islands. So trying to put into practice the, might say, legal text that would help governments to work together to managing key areas of the environment. Uh, I've you know, been involved since in most of the, the, the following summits uh, UNEP moved me to, to Geneva just after the, the Earth Summit to coordinate the UN system-wide Earth Watch, in which I was responsible for helping 50 parts of the United Nations system to work with the scientific community and, and governments and all to better monitor and assess the global environment. And you know, this, all the satellite missions, the, 
the reports of the state of the environment, indicated sustainable development. I was sort of co trying, co orchestrating and coordinating the whole UN system to see what was happening and to keep make sure government saw the best science taking place. And of course, when you've seen what the science is requiring, and then you see how much we have failed to implement what is agreed. We've had a series of, of conventions adopted, some in Rio and beyond, and governments like to sign up to promises. We have the, the Paris Agreement on climate change and so on, but implementation always falls short because we don't have any means of enforcement at the global level. So you might say, you know, the result of the, the 50 years of experience has been to think we're really, you know, our failure has been in a level of governments that corresponds to the problems we're facing. And of course, they have become more and more urgent. We, we summarize some of this in the first chapter on the challenges of the 21st century. We come back to it later in the book, or more specifically, the environmental dimension. And I've since been working with the Climate Governance Commission and others on proposals for a global environment agency that actually could you know, do what needs to be done to, to manage these environmental challenges. The boundaries were, were overshooting the destruction of you know, the stability of the planetary system and threatening our own future. So, but again here, you know, and we've covered it in this book and, and elsewhere, uh, we, we know what needs to be done. The science is quite clear, but we keep running up against this fundamental failure, which is that governments are clinging to national sovereignty, even though it doesn't exist anymore in a globalized world, really. They have very little control of all the things that are happening to them, but they still hold on partly because it, it, it feeds, feeds the ego of those leaders who want to be, you know, a leading nation or their nation dominating the world or so on. Uh, uh, and so it's the, it's the human failings of so many of our leaders that result in the complete blockage in the kind of evolution that we try to work for in this book. And we hope as we can go through the study with you in the next several weeks of your, of your review, that you can sort of come on board with what we see are practical ways forward to sort of save us from ourselves and uh, can then take that message out to the rest of the world and say, we need to get moving on this very quickly because we can see from the climate change problem and others, if we don't act very rapidly in a very short period of time, we're going to face all sorts of catastrophes that we can think about. Already sea level rise is, is well programmed and we're, we'll probably see the loss of small island developing states that are you know, already near sea level, not to mention most of the, the port cities of the world and therefore hundreds of millions of people forced, displaced and forced to migrate. And the, the challenges that are coming that are already, you might say, built in to the challenges of governance in the years ahead are really quite frightening. I think we hardly can cope with a few you know, refugees at the moment. What do we do if there are hundreds of millions of people desperate to find another place to live? So these are the, you might say, the, the motivations that drove me to work with Augusto and Maya to put together the best times that we could to actually you know, say, this is the solutions that we need to pursue now. They're on the table. Uh, and you know, we, what can we do to force our leaders to finally listen to some common sense and take us forward? So I'll stop there to leave some time for, my, for Maya to conclude our uh, opening comments. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, author. Maya? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, in terms of, of my background and, and why I got involved in this project, I guess <clears throat> from an early age, um, growing up in Canada, uh, in a very multicultural society or with multicultural values, um, <clears throat> also with a, an American father who had um, left the US, he was during the Vietnam War, he was drafted in fact, but failed the medical exam and always had a very uneasy feeling about American foreign policy and exceptionalism and a militarized view of uh, international governance. Um, <clears throat> so I think that childhood was very, very formative. And also this, this sense, um, growing up in Canada with uh, the sense for my parents that paying taxes to sort of like a peace economy was a very, very, very positive thing. Um, and, and you'll see in our book also in later chapters talking about a new funding mechanism for, for the UN, a, a very sensible uh, one. So um, <clears throat> I guess from an early age, uh, I saw the problems with the current order and, and then went on to a very international education at a United World College, in uh, first at Pearson College, um, that was 
they were put in place the United World Colleges to to build international peace and understanding through education. So I was with you know the later years, years of high school and early university with 175 different nationalities were my peers uh, living together, studying together, talking about international issues. So you know again this this sense of of you know, a very close international community um, um, that I was lucky enough to have uh, from, from a young age, and then went on to, you know, study at different universities around the world, in the US and the UK, and, and doing, in terms of law studies, both civil and common law uh, studies. So the two of the major legal traditions of, of, of the world, which have been very, very helpful, for international legal legal practice and and this notion that also is interwoven in the book, or we 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 try to emphasize, you know, the sense of unity and diversity, and that any international system should you know think about an evolved subsidiarity kind of approach and protect national or subnational autonomy in in in, in a reasonable way, and should actually allow diversity, cultural diversity, other diversities to to actually flourish. So it's not this over centralization. So um, I guess I was naturally drawn into international law after uh, legal studies and ended up practicing in in the Hague here in the Hague for about fifteen years now. After practicing um, corporate law for a time in New York City all, during the Great Financial Crisis, which was quite an education <laughs> in terms of the instability of the international financial system and systemic risk. And I remember thinking in the middle of that financial crisis that those global systemic failings and, and also the ethical uh, roots, the, the, the lack of ethics that really led to that, also the lack of laws, of course, um, uh, but thinking, oh, this is how the global ecological crisis might happen, <laughs> you know, how this, these systemic failures of, of our systems and, and our thinking and our, and, our, and our wishful thinking that we can run, you know, really tremendous risks without proper regulation and response and get, get away scot-free, you know, their, their implications for, for not dealing with uh, these these massive risks and challenges that that are that are out there. So, anyways, I ended up in the Hague working at a few of the international criminal tribunals, two two of which were established by the Security Council. You know, in quite progressive moves, the the former uh, the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the special tribunal for 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 Lebanon, um, which also had uh, Security Council components. Um, and then also working on negotiations, background preparation, servicing, operation of various binding international treaties with judges from around the world, uh, diplomats, academics, civil society. Um, so a very broad range of, of stakeholders um, and uh, very, it, it, yeah, also very diverse legal traditions. For example, we had a project with a Sharia law legal jurisdictions and you know, through that experience, um, you know, you, you can really feel the, the manifestation of really this cooperative, you know, this powerfully cooperative, you know, positive international community. Um, in, in general, the international civil servants and others working had very common shared values and really loved working together to solve international uh, problems. So that was also, you know, often very challenging trying to get the adequate levels of, of consultation and also the technical issues, studying the diversities and, and mediating the legal diversities between system, different systems, but also the, 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 the sort of motivation and the enthusiasm of, of uh, um, international officials, experts and others uh, from all governments all around the world from every region really devoted to working together and and really finding it such a rewarding and joyful kind of um, project so this also gives me a lot of hope in terms of you know what we can do in the international system um, going forward um, so what i saw which brings me sort of to why I was very interested in thinking about a new, you know, the next generation, the next uh, leap, progressive leap forward on international governments. I saw in, in the international legal practice and being in and around various Hague and New York institution is, is the, you know, the fragmentation in the international system and um, 
the, the work that has left been left undone. You know, uh, it was mentioned earlier, Article 109, and you know, the intention that the charter was supposed to be uh, reviewed, reformed, it's now 75 plus years old. And as a treaty, as a legal instrument, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary legal instrument uh, working on many treaties. I mean, the quality of, of the UN Charter, uh, both in drafting um, and in content and in vision is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, so it, it, I mean, it was without a doubt an absolutely visionary uh, um, instrument, but it has that key architecture has been has not been you know um, evolved, progressed, uh, uh, you know taken the next step forward, and and that's very very clear from uh, various international legal institutions. For example, the International Court of Justice, which is annexed, its statute is annexed to the Charter, um, has not been reformed you know since the Charter was adopted in 1945, and it's not keeping pace with other more modern international criminal tribunals and, and other international tribunals and the ICC even, it's out of date. Uh, you can say it's it's about you know, 20, 20 or so years old, but the ICJ even more so. Um, so this is sort of like an, an amnesia and forgetting, you know, the UN Security Council, which has been a topic of a lot of debate uh, for reform, but in our view and, and what we set out in the book is that there should be a, a different paradigm, you know, too often a lot of the reform uh, discussions have been about like adding another powerful actor from a region to the Security Council and even keep the, with them retaining the veto, no, there, it should be a paradigm shift towards a truly uh, uh, rule of law system, system based on the rule of law, based on contemporary governance legitimacy that we, we take for granted everywhere else. But for some reason, uh, we, we don't think uh, that we should, we, we're entitled to, or that we can um, achieve or that we should achieve, you know, more governance legitimacy uh, and effectiveness also at the international level. So, that there are these defunct models. It was that was a very it was like a beta version of international governance, which and we're still you know working with this sort of arrested development in in that respect. Um, so and just alongside you know kind of seeing that in practice with the various institutions I was working with, and and also seeing the the contemporary community uh, relatedness and and shared values all over the world. Um, the Hague also is is really an extraordinary, um, both modern, you know, center of international law, but also uh, in terms of the history uh, of international law, international legal institutions, which is extremely inspiring and not well known. So, you know, there there was the first Hague Peace Conference in 1899 and then 1907, uh, which led to the establishment of you know the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which was the first you know. Standing Arbitration Institute meant to give states a legal arbitration, peaceful dispute settlement uh, method to to avoid conflict, to avoid war, um, and uh, then you know then the the Permanent Court of International Justice with the League of Nations was in the Hague. The Peace Palace was built in, in and opened in 1913, which now houses the International Court of Justice. And then you have all of the other international legal institutions here. Um, but there's all these visionary sort of um, both institutions, documents, uh, uh, personalities, including many from the US, and also in incredible records of transnational civil society, for example, related to the, 19, uh, the 1899 Peace Conference and 1907 Peace Conference is here, just, just extraordinary statements and, and really beautiful vision. And, 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 and also a lot of this vision from these early uh, ages is, is they're not cynical. <laughs> they're, they're, they are realistic, they understand the challenges, but they have, a beauty in the clarity of, of, of thought and also, you know, this notion that our institutions and our actions should follow ethics. We shouldn't say, oh, we, we can't, that is utopian because, you know, it might be too ethical. <laughs> you know, some, some of the dialogue I often hear in these international governance, uh, uh, or that's the implicit kind of um, dialogue. Anyways, that's maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end there and then we can talk about the, the first uh, chapters uh, in 
in a moment, but just to mention also kind of as background and, and, and what I'm doing at the moment, Arthur mentioned the Climate Governance Commission that I've been, been working on and indeed how, how we really get the international community to start thinking in a much more ambitious way about our governance, international governance response to uh, the climate uh, and related planetary boundaries crisis, which is, which is, you know, according to science, really a, a planetary, a genuine planetary emergency. Um, so we have now Mary Robinson of the Elders and, and others, eminent persons, former states people working on this, um, as well as, you know, I'm working also now on this International Anti-Corruption Court, which has the support of the Canadian and Dutch government. Uh, so, so it shows also that you know, there is an appetite uh, with in contemporary states people and 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 those involved in thought leadership and also in government now, if if sort of proposals are presented um, in a way that that they can you know access and and connects with what they're thinking and and the challenges that they see, there there actually are pathways to really talk about the types of um, reforms and and progress that we think uh, is necessary. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maya. So at this point, we'll move to the questions and answers. Um, I have a discussion. I have three reminders just to the group. Um, one is if you would raise your cyber hand if you wanna ask a question, which automatically puts you in line. So uh, that would be very helpful for people who have trouble with that function. After I clear all the cyber hands, then I'll take the, I'll call for the flesh and blood hands and we'll, um, we'll get those people in. So that's a first reminder. Um, second, um, given the vast uh, range of experience and, and expertise of our authors, we can go in many, many directions. But what I'd like to do first is make sure that those people that have questions in the first three chapters get a chance to ask those questions because we are focusing on the book and on the first three chapters. So, um, so if those people make sure they get in line and then we could, if we have more time, we can go in any one of a number of directions, and um, and we'll take it from there. So I see Art, you're up first. You have to go off mute, and then um, you could ask your question. Okay, I see your lips moving, but we don't hear the sound. Okay, still not hearing you. Still not getting your sound. Okay, if you want to work on that, I'll go to the second question, then we'll loop back to you. So Gail, you're the next one up. And then uh, Virginia, and then I see some flesh and blood hands we'll take next. So uh, Gail? Um, there were a couple things that struck me. One was that um, there, the different countries joined at different times, and um, it grew slowly. And so, I mean, that's just something that struck me. We We don't have to say... Okay, everybody has to join at once and have the same, you know, everything the same. Um, another thing that struck me is that 150 decisions were made between 1988 and 89, which was the same as for the previous decade, which means that it took time for the members to um, become confident and feel like it was something useful. And um, well, that, that's a very encouraging sign in my um, opinion. So those things struck me. And I had an another thing struck me, I have a question about probably for Maya, and that is that international law was, it is, is biased to maintain big power dominance. And I'd never thought about that. And I'm wondering um, if you could explain what you mean by that and um, how you think it should be um, revised to be more inclusive. Thank you. Uh, Maya? Sure. Well, I guess international law bias towards the, the, the big powers. First, uh, of course, there's a special status of the Security Council members, the permanent members, who have special prerogatives within the whole UN system. Um, <clears throat> so Security Council should be reformed. Um, uh, also, 
in terms of international law, which is primarily treaty based. So, so if, if you have, you know, more negotiating capacity, more resources, uh, then you will fare generally better in, in these treaty making processes, just generally in terms of the law making. And then, of course, um, at the various treaty organizations and, and the treaties themselves, um, and, uh, but this can happen with any individual state, not just great powers, but the great powers generally stay out of you know, treaties which they think will be, um, quote unquote, not in their interest in the sense that it might limit their flexibility in, in, in exercising their power. So you know, famously and notoriously, the US, Russia, uh, China, Iran are not parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. None of them have accepted the the compulsory jurisdiction of the of the International Court of Justice, like the general compulsory jurisdiction, as you would, you know, imagine from a normal <laughs> normal rule of law system. Um, and of course, also there's there's then the the sort of dominance that that plays out behind the scenes in negotiations when small states are are pressured or 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 bribed. Um, uh, by by the larger powers in various ways, so those are just a few ways. I mean, to to, I mean, I've I've written, I've done a few policy briefs re recently on like an international rule of law package where the UN Charter would be amended just to say the ICJ should be mandatory, the ICC should be mandatory. There should be core international legal institutions that are mandatory for all members, just as an obvious kind of rule of law attribute to the to the system. So that would be one way to to correct that. Right. But then, you, you might, yeah, then you have to have stronger any, any, institutions. Oh. Sorry, well, then you, you have to have stronger institutions also, yes. Great. Thanks. Do any of our other authors want to speak to that? Okay, hearing none. Um, author, is your sound now working? Yeah, yeah now, now I'm on a laptop. Is this working better now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I, I just, great. before you start, before you ask your question, I just want to remind everyone, I forgot to say before, if everyone would please be brief, in their questions or comments so that we can include more people. Thank you. Go ahead, Arthur. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I loved your talking about how, how joyous it was to work with the other people in developing these uh, actual effective instruments for being able to enforce uh, international law. Uh, that was so great. And the whole proposal, it, it's so great. But uh, I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, Arthur mentioned that it was sort of like bad bad actors, we've had some bad leaders that have uh, made it uh, uh, difficult to do this, but that's, that's, isn't it true that the entire system puts into power, you know, those leaders who protect us against them and who are more uh, nationalistic? I mean, the, the whole nation state system mitigates against leaders who develop in world law, and those that do are uh, really extraordinary people who are kind of fighting against the tide. So what I'm wondering is, what are some of these institutional changes, like a, like a a world parliament or other things that could be initiated and could begin from the bottom up, could begin in interactive apps that we're all developing, these Zoom meetings and other things that we could do without waiting for the nation states. You know, the people start doing it, maybe the nation will run to catch up. What, what can actually be done to create some of these institutions uh, from the bottom up? Okay, Arthur, I'm sorry, let me cut in and remind everyone that's the entire rest of the book. So uh -huh. we're, we're trying to focus on the first three chapters. So. Um, uh, I'll let anybody respond to, to, you know, the authors respond to what you said, but that's the entire rest of the book. So we're trying to stay on the first three chapters today. But do any of the authors want to give a, a, a quick response to that, knowing that we have several months to answer that question? Just very quickly to note that in the last 20 to 30 years, we have seen um, a, a kind of a power shift of sorts from governments, uh, which are increasingly unable to address many of the global problems that we face, um, towards civil society organizations, and I guess to some extent also the business community. Um, when I'm thinking about some of the important innovations that have taken place in the last 20, 30 years in the area of international cooperation, the Landmines Treaty, the International Criminal Court, uh, more recently, the Treaty on the Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, all of these uh, initiatives actually started out with civil society. They were not led by governments. In fact, governments resisted very often many of these initiatives until 
a kind of a critical mass uh, was achieved by having hundreds and hundreds of uh, civil society organizations um, you know, draft these treaties and work together to, to call the attention of, of governments that eventually they became um, you know, international law and, and, and treaties. And so um, I find that very encouraging. And I think that that will continue because we are already seeing, certainly in the context of climate change, that governments are not up to the task. Um, as Arthur made it clear in his in his remarks, uh, um, climate change is going to uh, accelerate in coming years, and it will lead to a great deal of dysfunction and uh, chaos and needless human suffering. And governments, I think, are going to be seen by by the international community as having been uh, uh, to to a great extent responsible for this lack of action. And I think that will further empower civil society organizations and other non-state actors. And I think that's that's actually uh, a good trend. And it, I think it encapsulates the, uh, the hopes for, for significant reforms in coming years and in coming decades. Great. Thank you, Augusto. Would any of the other authors like to comment as well? Okay, hearing none, let's go on to Virginia. Thank you so much. I appreciate your all three of your presence very much yeah. and wondered if you would consider or have considered uh, this philosoph philosophical approach to the all the challenges of this world right now, which is the global problematique, which gets away from the siloing that happens at the UN when departments don't even talk to each other, uh, which happens so often. I have a lot of experience there and I just I uh, wanted to comment Janella Meadows, the great environmentalist who had a very early death, unfortunately, but wrote a lot about the global problematique. Uh, so many disciplines are siloed, you know, medicine, and but so is the international community. Without looking at the whole picture and all the issues together as one, where are we going to be? Okay. Thank you, Virginia. Um, any of the authors like to speak to that? Yes, please. I, mean, I worked with Donana Meadows when I was working on Indicative Sustainable Development. Uh, and of course, I did a book review of Limits to Growth in 1972 when it first came out. And as a, as a specialist on complex systems, you know, my whole career has been about breaking down silos and seeing the complexity and linking the environmental, the social, the, the political, the economic, you know, together. In a, in a broader system as you to plan a, you know, better ways forward. And that's why part of the thinking behind our book has been to try to design institutions that would get away from those siloed approaches. And of course, part of this also has to be on the love of education, where you know, too often our educational systems trap people inside of a thing. And therefore, more and more universities and others are actually developing interdisciplinary programs and helping to, to break this down. So there, there's progress. And I think you know science is certainly driving us in that direction because the science as well. But you know the trouble is so, so often you know we're trapped in that side of thinking. So for instance, in the environmental area, we have a climate convention, and then we have a biodiversity convention, and then we're working on a plastic pollution convention. We have several different chemicals conventions, and you can't just put conventions together easily. Each one is a separate conference of the parties. It's a separate international instrument. You know, it's the wrong legal structure for the kind of environmental challenges we're facing today. So part of our thinking, like, how do we design a system that can take what we learned from the conventions, but put it into coherent global legislation that is much more comprehensive than each issue dealt with separately. So that's part of our thinking is to figure out the institutions that could do that in the years coming ahead. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any of the other authors like to comment? Okay. Um, I, I did see a few flesh and blood hands, so I'll let those people get in front of me. Uh, so Simon. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution to uh, what we are aiming at, getting the world united. Um, the question I have that was mentioned is the veto power uh, that was started, uh, as you recall, by Stalin uh, to prevent his cooperation and his dominance over the world, which continues with Putin. The second question I have is the 
resolution of that problem by the European Union, where they establish supranational laws that have to be obeyed rather than national sovereign laws. Uh, and that's how the European Union came together as a functional, uh, uh, a successful unity. Uh, those are my two questions. How can we abolish this veto power in the uh, United Nations Security Council? And how can we bring not only the 27 nations of the European Union together by education and preparation, but the whole 193 countries of the world together by supranational laws? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to comment? Um, I'm happy to yes. say a few words. Um, I think that the reference to Stalin is correct. Uh, Stalin essentially made it a condition of the Soviet Union adopting the UN Charter, um, you know, for, to, for, the, for there to be something like the veto power. He did not wish this organization to ever tell him what to do and to uh, impair in some way his national prerogatives. However, Simon, let me add one important footnote to that statement. And after Stalin had made it clear that there was the only way in which he would accept the United Nations was with a veto in the Security Council, Roosevelt himself felt that in order to gain the support of the US Senate, where he needed a two thirds majority to endorse the UN Charter, he needed to water down the UN Charter and to make it acceptable to senators from uh, North Dakota and Alabama, and Mississippi and Oklahoma and so on and so forth. Right? And in fact, um, th this is something that we go into uh, in, um, in chapter two. And I see that Professor Barata is with us today and he's actually, uh, he has written very persuasively about this in 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 his uh, in his uh, book about uh, uh, you know world federation um, when the White House needed to get the support of the of the U.S. Senate, um, they basically made the case that look, this U.N. Charter is not going to uh, in any way stand in the way of us, the United States, continue to do whatever we want. I mean that was pretty much the message. Uh, it is such a weak body, and with the veto power, you know, we essentially are exempting ourselves from any of the obligations contained in the Charter. And so it was really both. It was Stalin and it was the U.S. Senate that, in fact, you know, were the driving force for the veto. And in fact, when the when the Charter was put up for a vote in the U.S. Senate, it was approved overwhelmingly by the great majority of, of, of senators uh, because it was perceived as a harmless organization. But of course, having been created as a harmless organization, not surprisingly, it proved to be very ineffective in many, in many areas uh, to this day. And for me, the war in Ukraine is a, very much uh, an example of that. Now, uh, your, your question about the European Union is very interesting one. And let me, let me share with you an anecdote, all right? Um, for, first of all, the European Union obviously will expand, right? Uh, if you ask me, uh, within the 10-year framework, uh, time frame, will, will it have more than 27 members? Absolutely, I have, I have no, no doubt. I think many of the Southeast, uh, Eastern European uh, countries, uh, you know, the former republics of Yugoslavia will join. Uh, as you know, Ukraine is putting a great deal of pressure uh, on, on the European Union at the moment to, to open up accession negotiations. And there is a great uh, deal of will, goodwill on the part of European countries, including at the commission, you know, to accelerate that process. It may well take 10 years, but I would not be surprised if it is done within the next decade. And Ukraine is a large country, you know, more than 40 million people. It has uh, an area that is larger than the area of France. So it would be a very important innovation. Um, I think that the United Kingdom will make a comeback. Um, there was a, a very important piece in the Financial Times uh, a couple of days ago by Mr. Rachman, who is one of the most insightful and, and uh, brilliant uh, uh, 
uh, regular contributors to the Financial Times, and he essentially is, is saying that the people who voted against, uh, against uh, um, the Brexiteers, you know, they, they, many of them have changed their mind. They have seen the high cost that, the, that Great Britain is paying for Brexit in terms of foregone economic growth, in terms of not being at the table where major decisions are being made and so on and so forth. And he anticipates that at some point, uh, you know, the political, the political uh, parties, the political establishment will, will catch up with what today apparently is, you know, sort of strong majority support for rejoining. So that will happen as well. But let me, let me go further. Um, and I'm going to provoke you a little bit. And, and I'm going to tap into a lecture that I gave a few years ago at the European Business School where I was asked to be provocative, and I was uh, provocative, right? At the moment, um, our conception of Europe is very much based on geography, right? The European Union has grown from six members in 1957 to 27 today, and maybe you know, 35 or 10 years from now. And it has done so by essentially expanding you know, to countries in the periphery. My uh, um, hypothesis is that the importance of geography in a world in which you know we're fully integrated, in which we have made huge innovations in in um, uh, uh, information and communication technologies, is declining. And what is emerging as being far more important is you know do we share the same values? Are we all democracies? Do we do we uh, respect human rights? Right, and so. If you say, yes, that is what is important, rather than whether we share a border with the European Union, there is no objective reason why, for instance, in the future, the European Union could not invite Uruguay, Costa Rica, Chile. Okay, I stop there. These are three of the most advanced countries in Latin America, more well-governed, with some of the best social and economic indicators, with long uh, traditions of democracy. Um, is there, other than geography, other than the fact that they don't share a border with the 27 members of the Euro Euro European Union, is there anything else that might prevent them from being members of the European Union? The answer to that question, technically speaking, is no. There is nothing other than geography, right? That, for me, is uh, sort of the next stage in the development of, of, this, of, this, of this particular grouping. Whether it happens in the next 10 years or the next 25 years, I don't know, but it's the next logical step. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Augusto. Uh, do any of the other authors want to respond to that point? Okay. Um, then I'll go on to the next question, which is mine. I actually, I had two questions. One is when we read uh, Joseph's book, The Politics of World Federation, um, he did touch on the fact that something like a world federation was briefly considered uh, in the formation of the United Nations. Um, and then in reading uh, chapter two of, of, of the current book, um, I, I, I got more of a sense of the depth to which it was really looked at. And I, I'm fascinated by that. And I'm wondering if there's anything more that any of the authors could say about that, about that period and, and really considering something like a world federation um, until it turned away from that. So that was, that's my first question. My second question comes out of something you just said, Augusto, um, which is within the world federalist movement, um, you know, we, we've defined a number of different paths to world federation. And, um, and one of them is looking, or not, not paths to it, but of what it might look like when it was done, uh, you know, when it was created. And one is using the uh, EU as a model. Um, so that's been one discussion. But the other conversation is the one that I've heard is the one you've mentioned right now is rather than use it as a model, let's just use it and have the EU expand. And at some point it might change its name, you know, instead of the uh, European Union, it's the World Union. Um, but the, um, so that's there, but I don't hear that talked about as much. So I'm wondering if any of you could speak of that or are there groups lobbying for that? Is that an ongoing conversation? Are people writing about that? Um, so those are my two questions. One about the earlier consideration of World Federation and the second of the EU itself becoming the nucleus 
of a world federation. Thank you. And I'll take any author who wants to respond. Um, let me let me tackle your first question. You know, uh, Professor Barata did a wonderful job in his in his book, which I greatly enjoyed, by the way, uh, reading, and which was a, a source of inspiration for Chapter Two in in our book. And uh, I think that one of the reasons why um, there was that kind of very progressive, very broad-minded, very ambitious thinking. Uh, in the, in the early 40s was because of the war. In other words, the war itself created an environment that was very propitious for the kind of uh, you know, farsighted thinking that was characteristic of the period leading up to the, to the creation of the, uh, of the United Nations, the UN Charter, and then even in the years after that. Right? And we, we don't have that at the moment, although that may change. That may change, I, uh, not because we necessarily a war. I think that climate change and, and its calamities, which are surely coming our way, I think could play a catalytic role in terms of um, strengthening the willingness of nations uh, you know, to come together and to create the in institutional infrastructures that are necessary, you know, to ensure peace, security, prosperity in the future, right? And who knows, uh, war could do it too, right? I mean, you know, we are in the middle of a bloody, bloody uh, war in Ukraine. Um, uh, there has seen some very irresponsible, loose language about the possible use of nuclear weapons by 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 Russia. Uh, um, the experts are saying that 2023 is going to be a very difficult, very dangerous uh, year because if, as seems likely, uh, Ukraine will continue to receive uh, you know, military assistance from the West and it will be, its military will be increasingly empowered, you know, uh, at some point uh, 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 Russia could be facing military defeat. Uh, and of course that for them would be virtually unthinkable because it raises the question of what this war was all about, right? Uh, there will probably be by within the next, uh, uh, you know, several months, a uh, sharp increase in casualties. Uh, the military experts are already saying that something like 200,000 um, uh, casualties on the Russian side, right? So at some point the question emerges, you know, what was this conflict uh, for? Right? Um, and, and so that creates potentially a very dangerous situation, right? So either climate change or war, and of course, as you know, we also have very serious security issues on the, on the, on the, in, in East Asia with China and its aspirations for the South China Sea, Taiwan, and so on and so forth. So we're not lacking in, in potential areas of conflict. We are facing a whole range of very, very significant catastrophic risks. And so the time may come Unfortunately, the time may come in the not too distant future when the, the context will in fact um, be similar to what we've had in the, in, the, in the early 1940s and contribute to, to sensitize not just civil society but governments as well to you know, the need for more ambitious, more ambitious uh, uh, reforms of the UN system and our, our global order. Um, I am not aware of any, any sort of thinking along the lines that I suggested of seeing the European Union as the, the you know, the, the sort of the, the germ or the, the seed, you know, for a future uh, much broader community of nations operating on the same principles. Um, what I see instead is certain attempts in various regions you know, to, to perhaps move in the direction of, of, of the European model, right? I'll give you an example. I admittedly, it's not a very good example, but it is symptomatic of, of what I've just said. Uh, Brazil and Argentina are currently discussing the possibility of introducing a common currency, right? Um, uh, when that idea was floated a, a couple of weeks ago, um, some top economists said, well, why would Brazil ever want to tie itself to a, a Argentina? As you know, 
Argentina is not a very well managed economy. It has very high inflation. It has defaulted on its debts and so on and so forth. So there are technical issues. And therefore, you can dismiss it quite easily as something that is unlikely to happen in the next few years. However, I mention it because it is an indication of a certain willingness on the part of countries when faced with huge problems, you know, internal as well as external, to think creatively of ways in which we can strengthen international cooperation. And the fact that it is Brazil and Argentina, two of the largest economies in Latin America, is itself significant, right? And so I think that that's, that's an interesting, interesting sort of development. Let me take just 30 seconds because um, I did not answer one of the questions raised by Simon. Uh, he was asking about the Security Council. And I just wanted to remind Simon that when the IMF and the World Bank were created, one year before the UN Charter was adopted, at the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, otherwise known as Bretton Woods, when they were discussing their, their governance mechanisms, they basically went for a system of weighted voting, which is what Grenville Clark was arguing for the, for the General Assembly. There is no veto in the IMF and the World Bank. They work by consensus, so it has worked well for them. Uh, um, the way that they have uh, 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 sort of uh, been able to uh, uh, work effectively in, in, in their respective areas of jurisdiction without the existence of a formal veto, you know, is itself illustrative of the fact that we don't need the veto within, within the UN Security Council. In fact, in the book, we will come to this later in one, one future chapter, we actually have a very explicit uh, proposal for doing away with the, with the veto by essentially reorganizing the voting power within the Security Council. But I don't want to rump, jump ahead of myself. We leave that for a future future conversation. Great, thank you, Augusto. I see both of our authors have comments. So let me bring you in and then we'll go to Drea. Thank you, just briefly on your second question, you know, certainly as Augusto mentioned, one way of a step forward towards giving up some sovereignty might be in a narrow area like climate change. If people, because the government already agree, it's so critical that already in this, like the coal and steel community, maybe there could be a step forward there. But we also suggest later in the book that if we really reached the point where most governments wanted to fix the UN, and it was the five permanent members who were blocking all change, one can actually imagine that the others would all say, let's create a new, better UN, separate from the present UN, and then offer you know, a, a buyout or a merger you know, later, uh, you know, and you know, leave the permanent members you know, forced to, to come back in on, on new grounds if they want to join the better organization. So that's another alternative going forward if we really cannot overcome you know, the challenge of you know, the, 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 permanent, the, the veto of the permanent members in the present organization is actually the better one alongside this one, maybe move across the specialized agencies and so on to the new one and leave the others holding an empty bag. So that's part of the kind of thinking that goes in the direction of the world federalists. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And Maya? Yeah, just picking up on a, a few of the points and, and questions, um, you know, talking about the veto and attachment to the vetoes. Um, yes, you know, Stalin concerns, Putin, um, uh, the Senate, U.S. Senate, but but the other permanent members also are very attached to their veto. <laughs> so it's sadly a, a question of you know humans' uh, interaction with power. And you know, uh, uh, corporate or 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 you know, identity units and their leaderships ident uh, identification with a pro special prerogative, an unfair prerogative, uh, uh, sort of a lever of of power, which is which is you know, sadly, uh, all too common in our various human governance systems. We see, of course, incarnations of abuses of power all over the world by by leaderships and and very unbalanced, unhealthy attachment to power prerogatives, and and just like in that vein, you know, we have a whole chapter in the book on values and principles and on education for transformation, and and you know, we talk in those chapters also about how you know how to also educate for more service minded 
internationally devoted civil servants and representatives. Um, and I just put in the chat also this extraordinary project by uh, Simon Anholt called the Good Country Project. Uh, which is kind of about this this shift from sort of a zero sum hierarchical competitive approach to international relations, which again you see played out also in the selfishness, the the way that national sovereignty is is conceived and how these prerogatives are just held onto for dear life, rather than thinking about what is a fair, what is a just system, what is what are the the you know co generative kinds of of power that we can create for the well being of all. Like we really need a paradigm shift and it's not just the Russia's of the world or the US's of the world. It's really our whole cultures of international relations, um, you know, the competitive kind of also paradigms of our societies. So I just wanted to share that good country project because it, it's, it's, a, it's to measure countries based on, you know, what kind of um, citizens they are towards the whole international uh, system, uh, which is again, it's, it's a paradigm shift from traditional international relations thinking, which has been so damaging to 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 the whole world, the, the you know the so-called realists who who now you know you talk to Harvard uh, political scientists and they're like, oh, sadly the Chinese have adopted a realist kind of theory about international relations. <laughs> it's it's a it's it's a really terrible paradigm, you know. Also, given you know the conditions where we have to cooperate, uh, there, there's no there's no choice. We have to find out healthy, balanced, uh, cooperative frameworks. And yes, indeed, including a new paradigm for the Security Council. But again, it's very rare. Like the chapter in our book, Chapter Seven, it's very rare to find such proposals where it's not a power based. You know, just adding on more power. It's so so taken as a given. In, in, in international uh, relations, sadly, uh, still, and also in, in in that respect, you know, the EU as a model or or as as sort of like a, a nucleus for a new you know international federation, that's not even you know in the mainstream policy thinking or or discourse. But I think it's the this rupture in intellectual history. You know, Bob, you're asking about the, you know that thinking about world federation. Gusto was mentioning, you know, the fomentation of a, a major international war calamity. It's a, it's a moment of clarity where you say, oh, yeah, this this didn't work out well. <laughs> this was a terrible experience. Um, so there's a moment of clarity after such terrible suffering and, and destruction. And, and indeed, we can't really predict what intersecting uh, calamities, how they will play out for us. But climate change um, and, and interrelated biodiversity crisis, planetary boundaries, it's such a novel crisis um, that, I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned that, you know, by, by the time that we realized what a calamity is, you know, we'll have crossed some of the tipping points. Anyways, that's another kind of conversation. But um, there, there is also, of course, the, the possibility that we can we can have enough norm entrepreneurship and high level discussion to, to take truly precautionary and preventative measures across the board. Um, also because there just hasn't been enough norm entrepreneurship and dialogue in high level sort of diplomatic spaces. And, and, and again, there is a receptivity, for example, when I've, when I've done you know, talks yeah. in Brussels with, with different ambassadors from the European, Union and European Union institutions, like on a rule of law package, which I uh, write about in the book, there's a great receptivity and, and they think, oh, we just haven't thought of this. So, I mean, and I, so I think the EU also isn't being, being used or mobilized as the force for um, international evolution. Personally, I don't know if it's the best model to serve as a nucleus for a whole world federation. I mean, it has to be, there's a lot to learn from the EU and so many different things one could improve. I mean, and this is working on international treaties that sometimes were cut and pasted directly into supranational EU law with direct effect. So um, uh, sometimes, I mean, the international can can learn from the EU and, and do something even more, um, uh, what's the word, more, more uh, progressive or more representative of all of humanity and can learn from the institutional learnings within the EU. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, like in the, in the policy discourse, this is not uh, talked about uh, enough yet. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, go to Drea, and we uh, just to point out, we are coming near the end of the session. Uh, go ahead, Drea. Uh, actually, this kind of ties on to what you were just saying, Maya, for my question and these paradigm shifts. So in this section of the social change, you know, you were talking about um, building equitable societies and, you know, with this frame of global governance. I'm just wondering what the role of capitalism and what you see that as the future in all of this because it just doesn't seem to go hand in hand. And especially when we're talking about the a lens of this environmental crisis that we are facing and will continue to face. Thank you. Any of our authors wanna respond to that? Yes, author? Well, I think if you look at, at capitalism, you know, sort of broadly, uh, given the values behind it, it is sort of greed institutionalized. It, it plays on the very materialistic view of, of society. Uh, and, you know, and, and the result, of course, that we have corporations in which the only legal responsibility is to generate profits for the shareholders. There's nothing in the legal charters that says they should do any kind of, of good to society, that they should respect any kind of social or environmental norms or so on. And there's no global legislation to require that. And so we've created these institutions that are sort of totally free to follow a very narrow set of values defined in materialist terms. And you know, the ends justify any means. This does not mean that we don't need some kind of organizations for econ economic productivity in society, but it does mean that the both, you might say both socialism has often been practiced and capitalism as it is practiced today are both very materialistic, very narrow, and they're, they're part of the silos that trap us in a very narrow way of seeing what is human well-being, you know, what is environmental and, and social good. And so I think we, we have to say that along with the, 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 the paradigm of national sovereignty that is holding us back, we also are trapped in some other paradigms of these very narrow views of what is you know, economic productivity, what is I mean, even such things as, as waged employment. You know, you know, things that make money for corporations are paid employment, but women raising children in the family, you are know, educating and so on, that's not counted as employment. It, it, it's, it, so I think we have, we have to sort of, think, we have to break away from all of these narrow paradigms that are trapping us in very unhealthy directions and say, we need to rethink all of these things as part of looking at better ways forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any, either of the other authors want to respond? Okay, um, so let's go on to John. We still do have time for another question or two. It'll, it'll be quick. So it's a yeah. response to what Arthur just said. Um, so one might argue, I think I would argue that the genius of capitalism is precisely that it plays to human nature and leverages human nature, uh, which you know to an extent is greedy. And you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, does not go well with human nature and didn't turn out too well. And so uh, I would argue that the problem with capitalism is that it is globalized and that to keep it oriented to the good of society it needs to be well regulated. And the regulation is not globalized. So multinational corporations uh, are not regulated in the way that they should be. So I don't see the problem as capitalism so much as globalization, so much as economics getting ahead of politics. Uh, if we'd put a price on carbon 30 years ago, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. And the authors want to respond? Just very briefly, I am sympathetic to your to your point of view, John. Um, um, I, I'm I'm a great admirer of the Nordic model to sort of economic governance. And uh, if you ask me, is Sweden or is Finland or Norway a capitalist uh, economy? And I would say yes, to, to, to a great extent, it does have features of capitalism. You know, it has private property um, and, and uh, you know, some of the other, other um, sort of foundations of capitalism, but it also has very good governance, right? And uh, it has uh, a deep democratic roots and it has respect for the rule of law. And by consensus, they have decided to adopt a 
a version of capitalism that happens to have a very extensive safety net that protects people and that provides you know, all kinds of social benefits, even though uh, the counterpart of that is very high levels of taxation, which they seem to be happy with. Right? And so I think that you know, um, perhaps the problem itself is not, is not intrinsically capitalism or some of the features that go along with the definition of capitalism. Perhaps it's just that in order to have a society that is uh, peaceful and, and, and secure and prosperous, uh, you need to build on some of the core elements of capitalism. And I think that the Nordic countries have done that very effectively. And, and many other countries in Europe as well, by the way. You know, we complain a lot about um, income inequality as being a global problem, which it is. But interestingly, I don't know whether you ladies and gentlemen know this, but the European Union is the region of the world that has the lowest Gini coefficients on average. Um, so it's the region of the world that has gone the furthest in addressing meaningfully income disparities. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. There is probably still a great deal of inequality within the European Union, but when you compare it with other regions of the world, it is by far and away the best. And the European Union does have, again, you know, many features of uh, sort of 21st century capitalism. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. So yes, just, Maya? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I uh, get a little bit disturbed, you know, when, when we throw around concepts like capitalism or socialism or communism, well, define your term. You know, it's a catch-all phrase used for certain uh, dimension economic uh, practices or regulatory practices or lack of practices. Um, so just that point is like, well, what do you mean by, by capitalism? I mean, maybe neoliberalism is a bit better defined, but I, I and I've, and of course, also socialism, like it's not a dichotomy, capitalism versus social. These are very kind of primitive ways of thinking. And, you know, markets and trading and business is inherent to sort of human activity in community. Um, so, so I would, I mean, personally, I would, I would dig into, uh, like, it, it's just such a broad catch-all sort of ideology. Um, um, I would dig into what is meant um, by, by quote unquote capitalism. So that's another whole discussion, of course. <laughs> but just to say, uh, uh, Drea, like, there's, there's a lot of really extraordinary thinking going on now because of, you know, the ecological pressures, of course, on our economies and, and the planet. So there's a lot of quite dramatic shifts that need to, to happen in our economic thinking. And they're becoming at least more mainstream in discourses or like the UN uh, high level dialogues, General Assembly about, you know, beyond GDP and, and, and UNDP and well-being economies. You have a number of heads of state who are really looking at, uh, at how to do some things differently. So, so there, there's a lot of fomentation, at least in, on the thinking theoretical level, but then we have to move to implementation indeed to get the, the equitable societies. And I think the sort of this Cold War dichotomy is really unhelpful. We have to get to a whole new way, way of thinking. Yes, of course we can use, we, we should and can use markets, the power of markets, the power of, of uh, individual uh, striving, which is part of human, but our altruism is also part of our human nature. There's, we're multifaceted. So I think it's a time of fomentation where we, we can um, get a lot of, 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 of different transition, again, beyond those, those terrible dichotomies. And just one last thing on the, the Scandinavian countries. I mean, and also, you know, there, there's like a loneliness crisis. There's high suicide rates and alcoholism, you know, which is tied uh, very much to materialism. And, and, you know, we also have to think about um, the social effects of excessive materialism and wealth accumulation as a paradigm, um, you know, and what our notions are of development. So this is like a multifaceted uh, discussion. So thank you for the good question and, and to be continued. <laughs> Great, thank you. So given the time, I want to turn once again to our authors to see if you have any um, closing comments that you want to make either on the discussion, the first three chapters, or anything you want to say about what's coming up next. Um, you, you don't have to say anything, but I did want to give you a moment if you want to say anything by way of wrap up. So author, I see your hand went up. Well, I think just, you know, we're seeing how complex these issues are. There are no simple solutions. Uh, and you know, all of the paradigms of the past 
are, are broken now. And it has, how do we both find better values to take forward? How do we question all of the different assumptions behind our society and say, what are the ones that need to change and evolve in a globalized world to bring that the well-being that we want? And I think we go through this for governance in our book. I'm sure that our future discussions will bring up with other areas as well, like this, these economic issues, which are too complex to deal with in 10 minutes here. Uh, but I think that we enjoy, thank you very much for joining all of us to get started. And we hope to enjoy the rest of the book and we'll keep this dialogue going for the rest of, the, of your study. Thank you. Terrific. Either of the other authors want to say anything by way of wrap up. I think that's, that's a nice closing by Arthur. He's <laughs> nicely summed it up. And <laughs> Laid, laid out our, our collective uh, inquiry here. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, in that case, I'd like to, oh, Augusto, did you want to say anything? No, no, just uh, to say that I enjoy very much this conversation and I look forward to future ones. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I want to invite everybody uh, to join me in thanking our three authors for all showing up for this first session. This was terrific. And um, what we're gonna do in, in a moment is um, the team debriefs, but I wanna invite the authors, if there's anything you wanted to say to our smaller team of myself, Drea and Gail, um, and then we'll continue on after that and just, just talking about the, the session and, and how it worked. So thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry, announcements. Uh, Gail, can you tell us uh, when our next meeting is? Yes, our next meeting will fit our pattern of the second Saturday of the month. That will be March 11, and it will be at the same time um, from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. That's the time we had originally. We digressed from that for the la during the last book because of the author's schedule, but we're going back to our original schedule, which is th this time, so same time and place and the second Saturday of the month, Mar March 11, we will be reading chapters four through eight. That's pages 81 to 180. That's the first half of part two. And of course, I'll send info to everybody. So you'll get that in writing by email. Great. Great. Thank you, Gail. And are there any announcements about events or things that people are promoting or just wanted to let folks know about? Going once, going twice. Okay, hearing none. Oh, uh, Arthur, I see your your finger. <laughs> you are on mute. You are still on mute. Yeah, I wanted to uh, announce that we've had some uh, very valuable uh, speakers on our People Powered Planet podcast, and that uh, every Wednesday, uh, and uh, there's some great ones to watch in the replay. If you just go to peoplepoweredplanet.com, and uh, we have a uh, a couple of excellent ones coming up. Uh, but this week we'll be talking about how to apply bully proofing techniques to solving some of these international conflicts. So if anybody wants to join us, that's 10 o'clock uh, on Wednesday. And uh, just go to, uh, you can just go to theworldismycountry.com and click on podcast to get the Zoom link. Great, thank you. And that's 10 o'clock West, West Coast time, correct? Author, that's 10 o'clock West Coast, correct? 10 o'clock, oh. yeah, 10 o'clock Pacific time. Pacific time, thank you. Right, thank uh, you. one o'clock Eastern. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, with that, everyone have a fabulous month. Enjoy your reading and uh, we'll see you next month. And again, I invite any, any of the authors who wanted to stay on just for another couple of moments. Okay. Bye everybody. That's a great work. Bye, thank you to the authors. You guys 